Hello and welcome to Story Bearers and Peacemakers. Uh, my name is Dan Maurice. I'm author of Finding the Peacemakers uh, here in Bristol. And my good friend, Phil Knox, author of Story Bearer, is joining us from uh, the wonderful Birmingham, the Venice of the North. Uh, and we're going to be chatting, interviewing each other, actually, uh, to talk about our own books and our stories, but also exploring how we can all become uh, peacemakers and story bearers in the communities where we all live. Um, so, uh, Phil, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Dan. Uh, brilliant to be with you. And hi, everybody out there. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a husband. I'm a dad. Uh, I'm a resident of the Venice of the North. Thanks for that introduction, Dan. Uh, nice. Also part of the team at the Evangelical Alliance. I'm a church leader. And as Dan said, I'm the author of Story Bearer. It's just so brilliant to be with you, Dan, talking about your book. And uh, maybe that's just a great place to start, really. Wouldn't, wouldn't if I could just ask you a few questions about that. And um, uh, if anyone has not seen it, this is the book, Finding the Peacemakers. It's just absolutely wonderful. I, I, I got this book a few weeks ago, really, really enjoyed it. Kind of kind of felt I, I, was, I went along the adventure with Dan, um, which we're going to kind of unpack over the next few minutes. But Dan, there's loads of stories in here about you as an adventurer. Um, mm. one, of the, one of the first stories, uh, for those who haven't, haven't read this yet, is that Dan's fascinated by the, the story of the Copiapo mine disaster. Um, that happened 2010, is that right, Dan? And, it is, yeah. uh, and, uh, and he was really fascinated by this story. So he was like, I really want to find out more. So most yeah. of us at that point would whack it into Google. Dan, you, you called up <laughs> the miners and yeah. said, I want the inside track. And so yeah. I love the bit where you kind of, you, you call up the guy and then you're like, and he basically says to you, call me when you land. <laughs> I just yeah. thought it was absolutely wonderful. Yeah. And again, yeah. again, most people at that point would kind of give up and go, I'm not going to Chile. But you get on a plane, get out there, and there's a real, throughout the book, throughout your various adventures, this real kind of can-do spirit that comes across. And I'd love to start, Dan, by just asking you kind of where that came from. What were the, what were the kind of influences in your life that grew that curiosity and adventure and spirit in you that makes you say, do you know what, if someone says, call me when you land in Chile, I'm actually going to do it. Yeah, for sure. Well, to be honest, it was I, I love biography as a young man. Um, I think growing up, I come from quite a secular sort of environment. I just went to a regular comprehensive school. My mates were mostly atheists. Um, and I had this sort of part of my life where I'd, someone had told me the gospel and I'd thought this, the life and the teaching of Jesus was amazing. But I didn't quite know how to translate that into my normal world. <laughs> you know, it's quite odd to be a a question in the 90s in a regular school and I was always kind of wondering what does it look like and I used I'd, I'd read these biographies of the great heroes of faith you know like Amy Carmichael who outlawed um, child slavery in India and in Tamil Nadu state particularly and then like Jim and Elizabeth Allett there were this amazing story some people know that story but uh, for those who don't this is one of the ones that captured me yeah. Jim Elliott went out to the Ecuadorian jungle um, to kind of just reach out to what was rumored to be one of the most savage tribes in the world and, and he was killed. Um, they speared him to death and several friends and everyone said, what a waste of time. And then his wife, Elizabeth Elliot said, well, if, they, if we want to tell them about the love and the forgiveness of Jesus, then I need to go yeah. and say, I forgive you. <laughs> so she did. And that, that these people who were, had only ever known revenge their whole life, they experienced this real forgiveness from her for the, the death of her husband. She met his killers and they transformed that community. Yeah. Um, just in real love. And I just, I read those stories and I thought, wow, you know, what's happening? <laughs> well, where are those happening today? And I really think those stories are happening today all over the yeah. world. But the, for me, the conviction was, I feel like they've been, you know, some of those particularly more spiritual ones have been slightly airbrushed out of the media. And, you know, we're quite a politically correct society and people don't know what to talk about faith, you know? <laughs> and so I was just hungry to know where those stories are happening. Um, so yeah, the sort of can-do spirit. I, you know, I was happy to take risks, but I also need to point out, I'm not a great adventurer. <laughs> like I, I always say there's two sorts of adventurers. There's the Bear Grylls types who know what they're doing. They've got some experience. And then there's the Bilbo Baggins types. <laughs> like I'm on an adventurer. I'm totally out of my depth. You know, are these other guys going to realise I don't know what I'm doing? Yeah. And so, yeah, all the way through the book, I wanted to be honest about the fact that I was I was in a pickle most of the time. And I did, I depended on the grace of God. Yeah. Um, not as like a nice spiritual thing to say, but as a sort of, um, I've got no backup plan. Help God. <laughs> Help yeah. God was probably my most frequent prayer. Yeah, that, that, that comes across quite strongly, Dan, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Matt. That's really good. I, and I think there's, I, I don't know about um, don't know about about, about you on you wrote it, but I, I think when when people read this, I imagine some people will go, 
do you know what? I, I want to be a bit more like Dan. I'm going to go and you know, take that step to be more adventurous. And so I think, you know, that's the first real thing to say. If you're someone who wants to be a bit more adventurous, you know, and, and maybe you feel a bit more like Bilbo Baggins than Bear Grylls, it's a great reason <laughs> to get the book really, really cool. Um, yeah. But that's not the major theme of the book. The major theme is what it says on the tin, which is finding the peacemakers. And yeah. I just love that. I, you know, it's a real, it's a really heartwarming read, Dan, because yeah. there's, there's so much stuff in there where you're like, I just, you know, again, there's so much bad news in the, in the news, isn't there? And I think so often we talk, yeah. I talk about being good news people in a bad news world. What you do is tell the good news of what's going on in terms of the hearts of people. And, um, yeah. you know, for, again, when you get hold of the book, you, you read about the stories of Jose Enriquez, who was the pastor in the mine, who basically kept peace amongst all the, um, uh, the, the miners down there. And I love the story about how they had a daily act of forgiveness that he yeah. kind of, curated you know we meet we meet Reza um who gets who's in a um a refugee camp and he gets placed in Finland is it right it gets kind of yeah. you know he gets the opportunity as to, to to have asylum in Finland and he turns it down because he feels God's called him to play a role as a peacemaker in this camp and there's this wonderful I think it's a wonderful line is that it says that no no one turns down Scandinavian countries that's, yeah, that's exactly, yeah. you know? and then we meet Kareem who has his face scarred by by fire as a young man and and then forgives those who who did that to him I I was really moved I've got to, I'm not a massive crier Dan but I'm, I've got to say that when you tell the story of Dave the football hooligan you know reuniting yeah, yeah. with reuniting with Divi you know and I guess you know I just wanted to give people a real a, a, an idea of the breadth of the peacemakers we meet in this book but yeah. you've you've met them all yeah you know, can you tell me what are the things that you see in them that kind of unites them about uh, in uh, as, as peacemakers and people to aspire to be like yeah, good question. Well, to be honest, I'd say I didn't actually see this theme to begin with. So the book really was a, a journey of faith. I didn't quite know how it would come together. I followed the stories I felt like God was leading me to when the doors are opened. And then it was actually when I completed the whole book. And I'd so, well, I didn't see it, it as actually my uh, editor, Jess, so huge kudos. To, <laughs> that was her idea, um, The Peacemakers. And it suddenly kind of, you know, it came into view and I thought, how did I miss this? They're exactly as you say, all these different people who had just had that same sort of faith, that same desire for peace. Mm. Um, and I kind of put them together and as you say it's like what are the common themes I was kind of interested <laughs> and for me I think probably the main one was just or as if I'll, I'll mention a few but for the main one was just real surrender and real sacrifice and I think um, there was one particular guy Sammy Awad who I met in Bethlehem mm. and he really kind of summarized all the stuff that um, I'd learned from other people along the way and he talked about um, peacemaking being a sacrifice and a real surrender and it's it's servant-hearted and I think a lot of people have the idea that you can just kind of go to two warring tribes and help them to, you know, love each other. <laughs> but actually the real calling of a peacemaker involves you laying down your own agenda. Right, yeah, Remember right. Sammy saying um, that line in the, in the Beatitudes, blessed of the peacemakers, is yeah, followed yeah. by blessed of the persecuted. Mm. And he said, you don't know who's going to persecute you. So if you're reaching out to your enemy in real love and real reconciliation, sometimes your enemy doesn't want that. They're like, actually, no, I... I don't want peace. And then sometimes the people on your side also don't want peace with the enemy. They want revenge. And so if you really want to be forgiving, then some people don't want that. And actually, partly it's laying down your own agenda. Often when you get hurt or when someone's upset you, if you really want to make peace with that person, you just have to let go of some stuff. You have to be like, you know what, I forgive you. And that's hard. <laughs> so I'd say the first one is real humility. And I saw actually a Jose at the beginning in the mine. Um, he... He wasn't so much negotiating a stalemate sort of peacemaking. He yeah. just brought a real presence, a real yeah. sort of shalom. And the other miners noticed it. They're like, look, this is a very stressful situation. How come, how come you're so chilled? <laughs> you know? And he just had this real faith that God was with them. And I think the others just saw something in him. And they're like, look, help us find what you've got. Yeah. Um, and that's when he started, you know, some guys had stolen emergency rations on day one. And he's like, look, we've got to, as you say, we've got to forgive them. And there was just that real desire to lay down your, you know, your agenda, what you want to do, your rights, just all of that has to go. Yeah. And to be a involves preferring the other. And the other thing I'd say is that you have to be brave. So partly it's surrendering your own agenda. Yeah. But also it takes courage to do that and to really, to really love the other. Um, I think one of the things I found most helpful is when, particularly Israel, Palestine is, you know, it's a, it's a famous, very, globally divisive issue and I find lots of people I met 
just even sadly in the West, people just seem to choose one side. <laughs> and before I went, so I spent a long time in the land in Israel and Palestine, in Bethlehem and Jerusalem, different cities, different communities, Arab, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, you know, met, met all sorts of different people. But before I went, often people would just tell me their narrative. They're like, yeah. these are the good guys yeah. and they're the bad guys. <laughs> and you go to a different pub and they'll tell you the opposite. Yeah. And I thought that was really, that was so sad um, because actually everyone I met had the capacity for real love. And actually I met loads of people who really wanted peace. Yeah. Actually, sometimes in the international community, there's more anger. Yeah. And the people on the ground, I met so many people who had lost a loved one yeah. from, from the other. There's an interesting movement called the Parent Circle where parents on both sides yeah. Uh, meet together and they're like you know what this is stupid we like I could be angry with you but that you've lost someone as well let's just let's just make sure that the next generation doesn't have so much hatred and death you know <laughs> and there was this real desire for peace um and so for Sammy that meant trying to put himself in the shoes of the other yeah and what he, what he would do is he'd go to a Jewish community and bear in mind his his grandfather had been killed um in the in yeah. the natural in 1948 by Israelis his no. family had made refugees. He was turfed out. Yeah. So he was in a community that was very angry. So, but he would go to the Jewish communities and say, look, I'm all is. Yeah. You tell me your version of events. Wow. And just listen. Yeah. And then they would listen to him. And then both sides, even if they couldn't reconcile, they'd be like, okay, I hear your story now. And that's yeah. the first step is just to listen. Actually, that's what I loved about your book. I, I, there was a couple of lines in it, which I wanted to pick up on. Yeah. Um, you talked about real listening well, i think that's a thing that we've lost a little bit in the west in our sort of distracted culture um you know what it's like when you're you can tell it on the phone sometimes even if you can't see them you're talking to the other persons it's just a pause yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you're doing something else yeah, the, the problem is now that i'm acutely aware of how how good am i at listening to you at this moment but carry on <laughs> yeah yeah exactly no no pressure but you said this about friendship um you said online online friendship can be almost completely cost free Offer and acceptance comes with a simple click. There's no obligation to give any significant amount of time and superficial conversation can be maintained via the occasional reaction to a status via an emoji. But real friendship costs something. And I found that so important because actually, yeah, you want those friends who, you know, not just like your post, who you could call up at three in the morning and yeah. say, I'm having a hard time and I'll come around. And just yeah. imagine if that, you could do that with someone who's actually someone that the other people will tell you is your enemy. And Sammy has those friends. He has Israelis who have been who've been raised to believe that he's the enemy, and yeah. he's been raised to believe that they're the enemy. And yet he has friends who have that level of friendship. Yeah, yeah. and I think that, that's wonderful. You can't beat that. No, and and I and I think what will happen as people read your book, Dan, is that people will, as well as wanting to be adventurers, people themselves will want to become peacemakers in their every day because you don't you don't have to go to Israel to to find conflict. It's everywhere, no. isn't it? Tell tell me a bit about kind of you know you you clearly have a heart and a passion to see people become to bring peace into their every day. Tell yeah. me a bit more about how you how you hope that will inspire people by reading the book. Well, I think actually the thing that I'm really passionate about is people reaching out to people in their actual community. So yeah. I think one of the problems in the West that we've experienced in this cultural moment is that people are so engaged at the political level. So yeah. people are talking about the leaders and what they should be doing, you know, uh, one side or the other. And it gets such yeah. anger whipped up at different sides. But actually, most of it makes no difference. You know, where, whatever you think of Boris, he's he probably doesn't care. You know what I mean? But I feel like, you know what, the one person you can reach out to is your neighbour. Yeah, great. So say, you know, I have the same challenge myself. I can get sucked into political debates just like anyone else. But sometimes I think, you know, what, what if I just put my phone down and went and knocked knock my neighbour's door and said, how you doing? Because that would make genuinely, if everyone in the country did that, it would make far more difference yeah. to health and the life of a nation than everybody fighting on social media, yeah. left, right, left, right, you know. <laughs> So I think for me, I just wanted to encourage people. And Sammy said the same. He's like, it's not just here. You go to the people in your community, yeah. but maybe you don't understand or, you know, different faith, different religion, different culture, different backgrounds, um, or maybe really similar to you, but just voted differently. Oh, goodness yeah. me. <laughs> you know, you're left there, right there, blue, you're red, whatever. Yeah. And just sit down and have a chat to them. And just yeah. like you said in your book, just listen. Yeah, without yeah. advising, without you know, without jutting in, <laughs> you know, sometimes you're talking to someone and they're doing this, 
Like you just want to No, just hang on a second, hang on a second. And when you when you can chat to someone and you're you're just listening, it's liberating. So I would just say, you know, to, I always encourage everybody, go and be that person. Go and sit down and just listen to someone and say, and this is what you do in your book, you say, what's your story? Yeah. Such a great open question, because people can do whatever they like with that. And often people talk for hours. <laughs> so because no one's ever asked them. And it's oh, I've learned so much from asking people that question, what's your story? Yeah, cool. Uh, we're going to have a slight in- interlude at this point where I'm going to ask you a, quick, a few quick fire ones to break the pace. Uh, you talk about a moment where you had, you needed some stuff for your feet, some stuff for your belly, and you need something for your soul. And you talked about hip flask. I want to know yeah. what was in the hip flask on your journey. It's actually bush mills. So no, real, real, real Scotch whiskey fans are horrified that had Irish whiskey. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. Um, I love bush uh, mills. Uh, there's also you talk there's an amazing moment where you talk about your journey um from egypt to uh, right up for israel um yeah. now i imagine that was and you can see on the cover that's very beautifully visually spectacular are there any other places where people can find photos from your journey yeah well actually we'll put some photos up on the screen i took a lot of photos on the way mainly because i just thought some of the stories i encountered were so remarkable i thought people yeah. might not believe them i want to show people so i can i've had little video interviews and i've got some photographs of the people i met and why i can i've had we know where it's safe to do so i've shared their voices and their stories um so all that you can put the photos on the screen all that is going to be um uh, it, was, it was on my social media basically so cool. the project around the book is called the luke x project yeah uh, so i was doing that with a team there was translators and filmmakers there as well and so just search the Luke X project on Luke, Facebook Luke, and Instagram. Luke X project. Yeah, so Luke is in the name Luke yeah. X project. Um, so L U K E X project. You'll find it. Cool. One thing I loved doing while I was reading your book, Dan, is you talk about this motivational moment where you were talking about being in the wilderness and you yeah. talked about a song on your Spotify playlist. Now, as I was reading the book, I tried to get into the, my kind of, you know, my inner. Yeah my inner Dan. So I put that song on as I was reading that little bit from the Grey Havens. What, I want to know what else was on your Spotify playlist as you're on your own for all this time. Yeah, day. it was an odd mix, to be honest. So I had a bit of Stormzy, got me going in the morning. Um, Lauren Daigle, very different to Stormzy, but very motivational, beautiful, like beautiful lyrics, beautiful voice. And then the whole song is kind of like my go-to in any situation. And then the Grey Havens I've already got into as well. So I don't know if anyone's ever made a, a playlist of Stormzy, Lauren Daigle, Hillsong and the Grey right. Havens. We need the peacemaker. We need the peacemaker playlist. And, yeah, uh, yeah, I'll get onto it. Yeah, Great. Okay. Uh, so the next thing around uh, I want to talk to you about is that you you talk about when you do this epic. Is it was it three hundred miles? Is that right? Uh, five hundred miles. Five hundred miles. Sorry for underplaying that. Five hundred <laughs> miles. Every single one of those. Um, you, you talk about the kind of the challenge it is and the the lack of comfort you felt. You know, yeah. there's, a, there's a moment where I think there's a, there's a line where you say, despite the challenges of the journey, I wouldn't trade it for all the country, for all the comforts in the world. And yeah. I was really fascinated by that because I'm observing in this time, there's a lot of people really growing during this time, emotionally, yeah. spiritually. I believe the Bible verse where it says that perseverance produces character. And yeah. um, how have you seen that in this last season of coronavirus, that same spirit that you encapsulate in this book that you wouldn't trade the, the, the challenges for the comforts of the world i would say one of the i think it's very uh, you read certain verses in scripture about trusting god and it can seem really nice but actually because we have quite comfortable lives in the west we did <laughs> until a year ago yeah. um until you're really tested those things yeah. like no you don't want to be masochistic you don't like go and make life really difficult but there's yeah. just times when life becomes hard and then those verses mean something and you yeah. pray like so for me, there was a lot of moments in the desert, particularly where I prayed, not as a last resort, as as a first and last resort. <laughs> like I ran out of water and I prayed that prayer, but sustained me the whole way. Dear God, help. <laughs> and um, and in those moments when there were some particular moments when God just showed up and then you're never the same again. You yeah. can't unsee those moments. Yeah. And so, and I, I think real friendship is forged in adversity. So just like the miners after 69 days underground, they have a level of friendship, like they yeah. have depended on each other to survive. Yeah. You can't yeah. replicate that level of friendship just in the pub with your mates. Brotherhood. Same in our, what's that? It was a brotherhood. Exactly, exactly, yeah. the brotherhood. And I think it's the same in our faith. 
in, in like Jesus says, I call you friends. Yeah. And in the same way, when you go for a battle together and you emerge out of it stronger, you have a stronger friendship. And I think God wants that. And he doesn't put us through strain deliberately. He's not like that. But he, I yeah. think he uses the challenges to draw alongside us and say, I've got you, mate. And those moments when you depend on him. And it, I always say he doesn't necessarily make things easier. And so for me, yeah. for example, there was many times when I, was, I just thought, Look, give me a helicopter, get me to Nazareth, you know, <laughs> and that's not what happened. But I did have moments where I sensed his presence with me and that made yeah. it, that made it beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I mean, just, just talking about that, the, the kind of last stages of your journey, just, just find a question for you this evening, Dan, around what, what I love, you know, it's a beautifully crafted book. And the yeah. kind of narrative arc, what happens towards the end is, sorry, to, it's, I'm not spoiling the ending, I don't think too much. <laughs> You're still alive, so you definitely don't die in the desert. Um, yeah. um, you kind of, you slow us right down and kind of, you know, it's almost like you are a kind of tour guide around yeah. the kind of various sites uh, around Israel. And, and you, you kind of close with, around, with some of the beautiful moments of the Easter story. Now, obviously, it's Easter this weekend, so that's timely yeah. to, to be talking about that now. What You know, as you were going around, what, were there any moments where you kind of, being in the Holy Land... Uh, there were some places which brought the Easter story alive in, in any way. Were there kind of any moments where you're like, wow, I now, I now get fresh insight into this yeah. story as a result of being here? Oh, absolutely. So I'd say the desert and, and Galilee were two of the main regions. There's a lot of sort of shrines and churches and building around some stuff. But I quite like the areas where it's like it was 2000 years ago. Like the desert hasn't changed much. <laughs> and I think for me that one of the things I found really powerful about it, um, particularly seeing some places was the realization that this happened. And so whilst I was physically in the desert, I was also doing a lot of homework in terms of a lot of the sort of latest archeological discoveries and doing my sort of, I was doing my academic homework and then I was physically in the desert trying to piece it together. And I was really surprised by, just really convicted by the fact that whatever people think about Jesus, he was real and he was there and he did this stuff. And the evidence is, is overwhelming. So I kind of wanted to invite people just to consider his life um and the things he said and the things that he did um and often i always I, I ask people who have a different sort of faith to me I often say look if if jesus wasn't divine if there was no there was nothing special about him then how did a sort of refugee turned carpenter mm. become the most influential person in human history like yeah. that for me feels like a leap of faith so i didn't want to i just wanted to kind of open up his journey invite people into often the very humble and human parts of his life. Didn't want to be too preachy, just wanted to kind of get into his story. Yeah. And then just kind of leave it with people, really, um, just so everyone has the opportunity to consider it. Um, but just to consider it in the actual places and tell the stories and look at the details and the evidence and that kind of stuff. And I kind of think that's, yeah, that's what I'd love to ask anyone, Christians, non-Christians, different faiths. Just to, I mean, Jesus is central to almost every faith. Um, and even, you know, to humanists would often say, who don't believe in God, well, Jesus was an inspiring figure. So I just think, is there something in his life that we could capture in this moment? Yeah. Um, and I really believe that God, you know, I believe, you know, I'm more honest than the book. I don't want to be preaching, but also be really dishonest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I believe. So, you know, uh, and I think as a, as a story of God is pursuing different people. Um, and I think for a lot of people, Christians like me, who have always thought, how do I share my faith? For me, I thought I'd go on a journey and kind of in, encapsulate the life of Jesus in the places he was um, but also for me I like my testimony isn't that exciting I looked into the claims of Jesus I did my homework and I was convinced yeah and yet some of the people I've met on my journey have such amazing testimony like like um, Dave Jill the football hooligan you mentioned just he left a life of violence I mean years and years of anger and hatred and all sorts of trouble yeah. in a moment of God in sort of Damascus road experience that all turned around and he became a football chaplain and a prison chaplain and a navy chaplain and just as as great a force for love as he previously was for anger and i find that inspiring but i thought what <laughs> i don't have that sort of story yeah. and that's what i loved about story bearers is you i felt like you tried to help people capture their own story um and kind of work out how they can share this with their friends in a way which isn't weird it's not religious i feel like you you have a passion to say look everyone's got a story yeah you know, how can you share it? So maybe I want to I turn around a little bit now and ask you some questions. <laughs> and so maybe just to begin with, could you just tell us the sort of vision and the heart? Why did you want to write this book that helps people capture their story? Yeah, thanks, Dan. I, I think it begins with a, a, a similar passion, really. I think I've, I've seen the difference, just as you've seen the difference uh, that Jesus uh, made in the people you met 
people's lives. I, I, I've seen the difference this refugee carpenter uh, has made in, in, in people's lives. You know, what, and I think, you know, I think we write about what really moves us. You know, what really moves me on, on the deepest possible level is knowing that I'm loved by the king of the world. You know, and that, yeah. you know, that really moves me. And, you know, this, this Easter reminds us of that. You know, this morning I was on my morning walk and I walked past the church where I live. And my, uh, my best mate was a, was, a, was a kind of builder, incredibly gifted, has kind of made this beautiful cross that goes on the front of our church, which is lit up. And I, as I walked past it, I, even though I, you know, I've, I've followed Jesus for over 30 years, I was really moved to the core because I remembered that it just, just reminded me that Jesus died for me. And yeah. I guess this is to, to a great extent, I've always wanted other people to know that. And, and so you know, someone who really not only loves Jesus themselves, but also wants other people to know that they're loved. Mm. Both research and experience tells me that the way people encounter this love for themselves is through friendship, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, the guy I've just talked about, Adam, my, my, you know, my best mate who, he was my best mate at school. We met, you know, on the probably the first day of secondary school. Mm. And, and I tell the story in the book about his journey to faith through over 10 years of praying for him, trying to do my best, messing up, Tell, trying to tell my story, inviting him to stuff and him not come in. But, you know, when he was 21, he became a Christian and his life now is so unbelievably different. You know, he's he's making crosses in front of churches, you know. And I was not an expert evangelist as a teenager. I was just a friend who tried to do my best. And I think, you know, you, uh, you know your story about peacemakers is the same, you know, friends trying to do their best. And I yeah. think that the way the world has changed is not through preachers on platforms. It's through everyday Christians living yeah. an authentic life and, and sharing their story with people who don't know Jesus yet. Oh, amazing. So what would you say to someone who feels like, I don't really have a story. Like, what would be your what would be your encouragement? How would you tell them? If, yes, you do. <laughs> yeah. And I, I guess the really simple message of the book is that if you are a Christian, you have a story to tell. Jesus has changed your life. You've encountered the creator of the universe and, and that that story, no matter how boring you think it is, it has the power to change someone else's life. You know, yeah. I, think I think there's a line in the book uh, that my teenage years were less sex, drugs and rock and roll and more projects, hugs and sausage rolls. Um, because I, I, used, I used to feel, I used to go to kind of, you know, these Christian events and there'd be this person on stage who had a, had a story like your hooligan mate who you know beat people up and kicked puppies and pushed old ladies into the road and took drugs and you know yeah. drank alcohol through their eyes and, and then they met Jesus and everything was okay I, my story wasn't like that um mm. so what the book kind of unpacks is just is how to talk about yeah why you're a Christian and, and my best piece of advice really is when someone asks you why you're a Christian is to tell your story and think about the words you'd use and and um and also not think about just the moment you became a Christian so often what happens when people tell their story is they talk about the moment they became a Christian, but yeah. then nothing else. You know, if you asked me about my relationship with my wife, my family, I wouldn't mm. tell you just about the moment I met Danny. I talk yeah. about what life is like now and the journey of friendship yeah. and faith. And so, yeah, so, so that's if, my hope is that people read Story Bear and go, I've got a story. It's worth telling. It can change someone's life. Yeah, definitely. Oh, that's so helpful. And just there was one like side tangent in the book, which I really liked. You got into the moment uh, where you talked a bit about the sort of science of storytelling. And I found that so good. Like, um, I quite like my sort of evidence behind stuff. It's, yeah. it seems sort of airy fairy. I'm a bit like, yeah, but is it, you know, <laughs> give me some facts. And you sort of just zoomed in and sort of unpacked why, you know, in terms of how our brains are wired, why we are narrative creatures. Yeah. Um, could you share some of the sort of biology of storytelling? That'd, that'd be great. Yeah, the, the inner teacher's coming out, Dan, that's beautiful. Yeah, exactly. uh, yeah so no, it's good. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've always been fascinated by stories. And so I talk about kind of the early book about, you know, about kind of reading Enid Blyton under, under the duvet as a kid. I've always been fascinated by story. And so I looked into a bit of the neurology of what happens when, when we hear stories and kind of various powerful kind of chemicals are released in our brain. So, you know, when, when, when you read the stories in your book, cortisols, Get produced in, in people's brains which makes them want to pay attention you know when uh, there's a another chemical uh, is oxytocin which is the same chemical that bonds a baby and their mother that's why we really care about what happens to, to characters in stories uh, yeah. you know another one is dopamine it makes you feel when you know when you turn the last page of a book when the credits roll at the end of a film it makes you feel good and then what's yeah. fascinating is as they've kind of scanned the brains of people um, as stories are told and stories are listened to, what they found is that exactly the same chemical pattern is released in the person telling the story 
as the person hearing the story. So what you know, it's it's kind of like you sync your brain to the other person's. That's yes. why storytelling so powerful. That's why yeah. music videos, you know, um, te- don't just have a picture of the band telling their story. They, you know, playing the song. They tell a story. And it's why. Yeah social media you know you, it doesn't just say take a po- take a photo on instagram it says tell your insta story you know and, and and it's why jesus was kind of cheating when he said you know i'm now going to tell you the truths of the universe i'm going to tell you a story he kind of yeah. he kind of created them and their power and the person who he was telling them to so yeah, to, uh, to really <laughs> but yeah that's that's a bit of the storytelling stuff yeah it's amazing and i thought maybe at this stage it'd be good well, just to kind of model it for people, how do you tell your story? So just imagine that I'm a guy you just met at the bus stop. And you go, oh, man, yeah, how's it going? Yeah. Uh, like, what's your story? What would you say to someone in, a, you know, in that moment? Yeah, so I, I grew up in a Christian family. Uh, my parents both really committed followers of Jesus. Um, I, 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 reckon, I recognize that I probably made a, a decision to follow Jesus when I was six years old. Someone told me that God loved me, that he died for me and rose again and, and that I could be his friend and go to heaven when I die. I thought this was the best news ever. I was even more excel- excitable then than I am now. And uh, I kind of that was my moment of choosing to follow Jesus. But I think through my teenage years, I probably had to recommit that decision as kind of various kind of challenges and and, and I think, you know, I'm making that faith my own. But the, the rubber really hit the road for me when I was 21. I was uh, sat having lunch with my mum, uh, phone rings and it's a family friend. And she says, I'm really sorry, Phil, but this morning your dad has died. And oh. and these words completely ripped my world apart. And yeah. I, I had this choice in that moment to say either God stuff you for letting that happen Oh God, mm. I really need you right now. And mm. I've been a Christian over 30 years. The closest I've ever known God with me was in those first few weeks after dad died. Wow. Um, and, I, and, you know, people watching this might be going through all kinds of suffering. If you are, I don't know all the time why it happens, but I do know that God is with us in, in, the, in, the, in the moments of suffering. Yeah. One of the most amazing things about following Jesus is he gives us a real purpose and meaning. So I found mm. that in helping others understand the, the Christian story as, a, as someone who shares good news. But mm. uh, I, more, more recently, the, the rubber's really hit the road for me again, where um, I've been diagnosed with the same heart condition um, that killed my dad at 48. And oh. um, there have been moments, genuinely in the middle of the night, where I've kind of, kind of woken up and my heart's been pounding and I've been thinking you know am I gonna die and, and yeah. I can't tell you what a difference it makes knowing God is with me in that moment but yeah. also knowing that whatever happens I know what I know where I'm going you know and yeah. I, I don't know what my future holds but I know who holds my future and, mm. and my story's ongoing as we've gone through coronavirus and in the last year uh, mm. I've, I've lost two close family members to cancer God's oh. with us in those moments and I don't know how people do that without Jesus with them so there's a there's a bit of my story. Oh, it's very good. Thank you. Well, thanks for sharing. And it's it's quite vulnerable, I think, sometimes to share your heart, you know, your heart struggles and your faith. Um, it takes a bit of vulnerability. And I think when you do that, people actually respect it. It kind of invites a little bit from people because when you, you know, when you take that risk, I think yeah. sometimes people think, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. They might, I don't know what they'd think. But yeah. my experience is people think, wow, thank you for kind of giving me the privilege yeah. of, of listening. And then it kind of almost gives permission for them to open up a little bit as well. Yeah, um, nice. oh, thanks for doing that so much. I think in terms of, uh, and I picked up a little list before, that authenticity and friendship and sharing your story, but also listening. Um, I thought th- what we shared a little bit before about that listening is so important. And it just, I don't know, the, the chapters you wrote on it just kind of caught me. Um, maybe because it's such an obvious sort of juxtaposition between the distracted friend <laughs> and the passionately listening friend. Um, so how would you, in terms of people watching this, so like we, we're all now digital natives to a certain extent we live in a distracted you know uh, digital world what advice would you give to people to kind of to become compassionate listening loving peacemaking friends in an age of distraction what what advice would you give well that that sounds like a 45 minute lecture to be honest but I'll yeah, do my best. Five seconds, mate. I'll do my best. um I, th- I think the first thing to say really is that i think friendship has changed even in this last you know few this year so you know we saw we saw some friends in person in the garden for the first time of the last couple of days um so i think i think it's a really good time to, to be thinking about friendship and, and and about our relationships in our lives i think i think my advice would be first of all be really intentional and be really realistic you know, yeah. we, we really we just don't have the, enough bandwidth to be friends with all of our Facebook friends. You know, yeah. and I think so find a few people 
and kind of throw yourself into a relationship with them. And I think, you know, as, as you as you identify when I told my story, being open, being vulnerable. So often it's it's vulnerability that unlocks something in other people. You know, I don't I don't want my friends to just talk to me about the football and just the you know, superficial events of their lives. I want people to be, I want to be vulnerable with other people. I want to, you know, that's how we connect, isn't it? And share your struggles and your pain, share your failures as well as your successes. You know, those kind of things make real friendship uh, and make friendship work well. So I think that's the first thing for that first kind of really intimate group of friends. I think there's a wider friendship that we have where we can be really generous and encouraging with people as well. So I think there's a kind of, yeah, I had this thing where during lockdown, I had a week off in like November and I was really, you know, I was missing people. So I decided to kind of write like 20 postcards to, you know, 20 fellows in my life and just say, just really value you. And I can't, I can't have the same level of contact with them as I have with two or three friends, but I can check in now and again and say, how are you doing? Just miss you, you know, and and, and a postcard or a text or something. And, you know, you talked about technology. Technology can be the enemy of friendship when we're distracted and trying to have a coffee with someone and our phones are going off and we're looking at that rather than the other person. But it also, technology can be mastered to give us a far wider and deeper friendship with other people. And the final thing I'd say around friendship is, is when you're out and about, smile and reach out to people. You know, yesterday morning, I bumped into this guy called Kyle who'd just moved to our area uh, he'd been in, you know, and he was the, you know, he was a guy who I kind of in, in early on the comes actually tell me your story. And he tells me how he's been homeless and been in prison and just moved here and he's got this flat with nothing in. And, and I've noticed that as I kind of walk around my community, as I run, as I smile at people, more mm. people, I think because people are starved of connection, smile back in a way that they didn't used to. And yeah. being open to, to friendship, it, I think he's really, really key at, at this time. So, yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks, Phil. I feel like we're coming into land. Maybe there's time for one more story. So there's one story in the book that I don't know why it just absolutely captured me. Um, I took a photo of it and sent it to my mates from WhatsApp. That's, that's digital technology for you. But it's a story of Lauren. Um, could you just tell, me, tell us that story? <laughs> yeah, of course I can. Yeah, Lauren's amazing. Um, yeah, she. Um, we've known Lauren for a number of years. She was having a really tough time a few years ago. And uh, my wife, Danny, uh, this isn't a story about me. This is a story about my wife, Danny, as a friend. And, and she was just there for us. She looked out for us. She, she prayed for us. She cared for us. There was a, a time when Lauren came to live with us in our house, you know, and her job w- was selling um, gas and electric to people. And um, uh, Lauren was on a journey of faith. And, and so we thought it'd be really good to invite her to Alpha, our church. So, um, so Danny invites her along to Alpha. And uh, it's the kind of the Tuesday morning before Alpha's at 7.30 in the evening. And she's having a rough day. She texts Danny with, the, I think, quite a colourful text, <laughs> a colourful language, not appropriate for Facebook Live before nine o'clock, um, and says that she's not coming because God's not answering her prayers and she's really fed up. So Danny's like, oh, what do I do? So Danny's instinct, she's a lot holier than me as my wife. And she says, do you know what I'm going to pray? So in that moment, she prays for Lauren. And... Um, what happens next is Lauren puts her phone in her pocket, having just texted Danny this angry text. So not that Lauren then knocks on this door and starts to talk to this guy about changing his electricity tariff. Mm-hmm. And um, as she's doing so, it, you, she's, you know, she's somewhere on a journey of faith, probably wouldn't call herself a Christian at this point, but she starts to hear God speaking to her some like, words for this guy. So she says to this guy, do you believe in God, mate? And this guy's like, you know, is this part of the pitch for the, you know, for the electricity? Yeah. And then she says, these words kind of, you know, floored him. She says, um, she says, you've, you've killed someone, haven't you? Yeah. And this guy's like, uh, yeah, yeah. I've, no just, I've just come out of prison. And, um, and, and, and Lauren's completely unfazed. And she's like, yeah, I know. I knew that God's telling me. And, um, and he's telling me that um, you not only need to forgive yourself, but you need to know that he forgives you, uh, for, what you for what you've done. And isn't that a really cool story? My guess is that he bought whatever she was selling <laughs> you know, at that point. Um, but anyway, she comes out of the meeting. She calls Danny. She tells Danny the story. She says, I'm coming to Alpha. She's really annoyed that Danny's been praying. But so there's a, really, you know, there's a story about the power of prayer, but it's also a story about how God is on, at work in people's lives. Anyway, Anyway, Lauren came to Alpha. She's now doing great. We're still in touch. We're great friends. And it's just, a, it's, a, it's a lovely little story about the power of prayer and, you know, God being at work in someone's life. It is, yeah. And it's also the thing I liked, and maybe this is what captured the heart of the people I met on my journey, is that God doesn't just take the people who are polished and experienced and that kind of stuff. He takes people where they're at, even when people are having a bad day. Sometimes yeah. 
he wants to intervene more when someone's had a bad day because he wants to show a bit of love. Yeah. That's the nature of a good father. And so for me, that caught that it caught the compassion of God, but also it showed the, the power of a of Danny, of a praying friend yeah. um, and yeah. someone who cared. So um yeah, let's in terms of like so you know, falls up in loads of exciting threads um in your in your book and mine. How would you kind of um how do you draw this together? So people going, you know, people logging off now, going to put the kettle on or have a beer yeah, or whatever. Yeah. What's your sort of take home point that you want people to be left with? Yeah, Dan, I thought I, I didn't come up with this. You, you, this is this is your copyright thing at the very beginning. But I loved the idea of story bearers and peacemakers. And so yeah. I think what we'd love to urge everybody to do, um, not not because we, 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 work, we, we care about book sales, we, you know, to some extent we do. But but what we really care about is people being impacted by these by these books and so i think our great encouragement to you if you're watching this is is please buy both books please take a look um i think they sit really nicely alongside each other you can choose which one you read first we don't mind mine's a bit shorter uh, <laughs> i'm not i'm not, not quite as clever as dan um but let us you know let us know what you think tell us in all seriousness we would just love you to to check them out i think they're also really accessible for people who are on a journey of faith um yeah. you know where, wherever they are i've had some lovely feedback around people who wouldn't yet call themselves Christians uh, around, the, around the book. And I'm, I'm sure you're, you're the same, Dan. You'll have, you'll have people who, who are just on a journey of faith. And if you're interested in the power of a relationship, if you want to be a better friend, if you want to make a difference in your community, these are two books I'd, I'd urge you to, to read. And, um, and in terms of how you can stay in touch, both of us are kind of on social media. You can find us. Um, you can grab the books um, from the IVP website or, or from the Hodder Faith website and... Um, uh, or any, wherever you get your books. Um, but Dan, it's been really lovely to chat to you. Just yeah, great, amazing. To, great to connect. Thanks for making the connection. And um, thanks for tonight. Really brilliant to hear some of the inside track um, on Finding the Peacemakers. So yeah, thank yeah. you. And thanks to Hot of Faith for hosting it and to Bern Lecky behind the scenes for making it happen. Um, we'll love you and leave you there. Phil, I'll see you hopefully again in real life when we're an hour <laughs> two. And to everyone watching, have a wonderful summer and hopefully it'll be a summer of freedom and peacemaking and story bearing.